you understood it, you could connect, you could go speak to the prophet. That window was open, and what did the prophets always say? Ko Amar Hashem. This is the word of Hashem. We knew it very, very clearly. But when that window was open, you could tap into that power and bring down sort of Koho Satoma. That was the Nevi'e Shekin. And they put in a certain energy into the wood and stone, and then people were, were drawn to it. There was a spiritual ecstasy. Wow, I want to run. Right? The Gemara tells us about King Menashe, that he lifted up his cloak to run to He said that you want to run. You wouldn't pick up your cloak to run to it. Him, he was already dignified. He didn't run to Davut. But there was a tremendous urge to run after the Avodazar because there was like a spiritual ecstasy that people felt with this Avodazar. But what happened? There was Yerida Sadoros. There was the de uh, declining of the generation. If I ask you, electricity, is that a good energy or a bad energy? Tons of electricity. Is that good or bad? Depends how you use it. A little bit of electricity, I can plug my iPhone, even though my iPhone is only four. But still, I can still use it to plug my iPhone, right? I'm not up to date, but it still works. If my little kid sticks his fork in the socket, he's going to get a shock. He's going to run to mommy. He's going to say, ah, look what happened to me. His mommy's going to scream at him. And then Abba's going to come and have to calm him down. And then I'm going to scream at him, right? Because it's going to be the whole chinuch thing. But at the end of the day, if it's misused by a child, it can hurt him. What if there's a lot of electricity? A power plant. It can power the whole entire city. Amazing. But what happens over there if one of the workers touches the live wire? He's fried on the spot. The more power we have, if we use it properly, a tremendous amount of koach we could use. If we misuse it, the damage is going to be so much greater. When this window is open between heaven and earth, tremendous amount of electricity. You can connect and have so much power and understand things so clearly. But if you misuse it, bam. Avodah Zara. Chayv Misa. Destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. And that's why the rabbis recognized that we were becoming like children. And you don't give such a strong, powerful tool to a child. If I have a chainsaw, it's a tremendous tool. I can build something with it. I can cut heavy wood with it. I can do a tremendous amount of things. But what happens if I give it to a child? It's dangerous. It's true, he might be able to use it properly, but he might also misuse it and hurt himself. The rabbis of that generation recognized that keeping this window open is like giving a chainsaw to a child. And we must close this window between heaven and earth. It's true, we have nevua, we have tremendous amount of electricity, but too many kids are touching the live wire and are falling to Avodah Zara. There's Yerida Sadoros. We must pray for that window to be shut. And that's what happened in that generation. That generation, Anshik Knesset Zagdola, the Talmud tells us about exactly how it happened. They got together and they prayed, please remove the Yetzir Hara for Avodah Zara. And the uh, Basco came down, they got a note from heaven that their tefillah was accepted, and a pillar of fire came out of Kodesh HaKodashim, because obviously the Yetzir Har of Avodah Zarah dwells right in the place that's the holiest of holies, because that's exactly the same energy, depends how you tap into it, and it leaves Kodesh HaKodashim. And that, the Gemara continues, it's not our topic, but the Gemara over there continues, they saw they had such good fortune with their request, they said, please remove the desire for inappropriate relationships, for alayot. And they, and they got an okay from heaven. But you know what happened? The earth went cold for three days. The chickens didn't lay their eggs. There was no warmth in the world. There was no desire. And they realized the world is not going to continue if we don't have a desire to procreate. So therefore, they requested it, please have a person have a bad desire only for his wife. And then heaven, they wrote them back a note. You can't have half a desire. Either you have it or you don't have it. Right? And that's exactly what happened. But they said, okay, but we, there won't be a desire for immediate relationship, for, for sisters, for parents. That they were able to remove. But that, that's the end of that Gemara over there. We know that the day, and according to the Ram, it's very interesting. The Ram brings down, there's still uh, an old Yemenite community that does this. We, we know that we're now in year Tafshin Ayin Vav. 
there are certain communities they used to count the years from the rule of Alexander the Great. And the Rambam explains, it's brought down in Seder Olam, Olam Rabbah, that the day the last prophet was Nifter, Malachi was Nifter, that's the day that Alexander the Great rose to power. Meaning, the day that we lost this prophecy, that we no longer have this window, that now there is something lacking about Shavuot. We do not have a clear relationship to Mount Sinai anymore because we don't have a prophet like we had for, throughout so many years, throughout so many centuries. So we're missing something on Shavuot. We don't have that prophecy anymore. On that day that we lost the prophecy, who rises to power? The Greeks. Alexander the Great, which was the, first, the beginning of the Greek Empire. And he starts to spread that culture throughout the world. Before that time, that world was a pagan world. And that's why our modern history, when we learn modern history in school, where does it start? It starts from the Greeks, from Aristotle, from Socrates, from Alexander the Great, because that is modern civilization. Beforehand, it was a prophetic age. It was the time that we were able to connect to God through Nebua, and the rest of the world was a pagan world that served idols. But now that window is closed, people are not starting to serve idols anymore. We need to find some culture. We need to find some science and some philosophy. It's a whole new world that is spreading onto world history and also onto Jewish history. Because now for the first time, we don't have Nebua anymore, but rather, what do we have? We have the Chachamim. If you look at the Mishnais and Perkei Avos, the first Mishnah is, Anshei Knesset Agdol, Heimon Rushlo Shadvar. What's the second Mishnah? Shimon HaTzadik, Hayo Mishayari Knesset Agdol. Shimon HaTzadik was from the remnant of Anshei Knesset Agdol, meaning he sat there in the men of the Great Assembly, 120 men, he saw prophets with his own eyes, he himself was not a prophet, but he was a man de Amar. For the first time in Jewish history, we have somebody saying, Ashita, Shimon Atzadik Haya Omer. He used to say something. How come we never have Yirmiyahu Hanavi Omer? David HaMelech Omer, Shlomo HaMelech Omer? Because they never said their own shah. What did they say? They said, Ko Amar Hashem. This is what Hashem said. This is the wisdom of Hashem. Because we had the Nebuah, the connection back to Sinai. But now for the first time, we don't have it. We have a man de Omer. We have the Chacham. We have the wisdom of the Greeks versus the wisdom of the rabbis. We have that equilibrium continues for us to choose where are we going to go. Beforehand, we had an equilibrium. Do we want the idol worship or do we want to follow the prophets? Now, do we want the science and the culture of the Greeks or do we want to follow what the rabbis say? Shimon Atzali. It's very interesting. Shimon Atzali, which is the first time in Pirkei Avos. So we know that the Talmud tells us the story how he met Alexander the Great. You see that it's Mamish in the same time period. Alexander was coming and taking, conquering over the whole world. He was going to come and overtake Yerushalayim and destroy it. And so Shimon Atzadik puts on his, his big, big coin guddle. He walks out towards him with two rabbis on either side with torches. They're walking all night. And when Alexander the Great finally meets him, so it says that he got off, off his horse and he went down and bowed down to him. Why bow down to this filthy Jew? Said his messenger. Said the guy next to him. So he says, you don't understand when I go to battle. I see Shimon Atzadik. I see his image in my dreams. I know I'm going to win. There's a connection right up there. The next mission of Imperios is Antignos, Ish Silko. Antignos, that's a Greek name. There's already the Greek influence on the Jewish people because Shimon Atzadik was able to convince Alexander the Great, don't conquer Yushalayim. You could stay here, but don't, don't conquer us. And Alexander respected the Jews. There's wisdom over here. There's, there's uh, intelligence. Look at their rabbis. This is something that, this is a culture that I value. Antiknos Ishsoka, he's already info, he's got the Greek name. And now that the Torah is no longer Ko Amar Hashem, it's up to the interpretation and the explanation of the rabbis, we for the first time have different sects within Judaism. Because who were the two students of Antiknos Ishsoka? Sadok and Baitos. Sadok and Baitos is the first sect that is breaking away within Judaism. The Tzdukim and the Baitusin. Because they're saying, oh, if you're explaining the Gemara that way, I got my own way to explain it. I'll explain the wisdom of the God Almighty in my own interpretation. This is the way I understand it. 
And this is the way you understand. And then the Mishnah continues. The Yeshua ben Prachi over there and, and uh, Nitai Arveli, the second Mishnah over there is, is right away referring to the first Machlokas we have within Judaism. We never had a Machlokas before because everything was called Mar Hashem. Now we have a Machlokas. There was one Machlokas over there and Yeshua ben Prachi already, his Talmud, started Christianity. We already have sects breaking off of Judaism and starting different religions because now there's no longer the clear connection back to Sinai. And if we don't have the clear connection back to Sinai, we're lacking something in our yearly cycle. But that is exactly where Hanukkah comes in. That is what the Hashmonayim stood up and were willing to fight. Because in the beginning, it was just the Greeks were around. There was beautiful Greek culture. Why not? They're wise. We're wise. We value their culture. It's great. Let's all get along. It's going to be great. But eventually, the Jewish people were so enamored by those lights. Wow. The stadiums and the gladiators and, and the culture and the philosophy. It's so amazing. And eventually, not only were Jews starting to be more and more like the Greeks, but the Greeks were starting to force it upon us. You can't keep Shabbos anymore. You can't have a bris mila. You can't have a rosh chodesh. They're starting to deny. What are they picking these, these specific mitzvahs? What do they care about? It? Because they were bothered by something. There's something that is different between their culture and our culture. The Greeks worshipped beauty. It was amazing for them. Wow, the physical body. It has to be perfect. The philosophy, the understanding. They, were, they, were, they loved it. They loved that culture. And they saw the Jewish people also loved it. But there's something that bothered them about the Jewish people. Because we saw the beauty in holiness. While they saw holiness in beauty. That was the difference. If you take the letters Yava, Yud, Vav, Nun, Sophis. Beautiful letters. Very symmetric. Three straight lines. It looks a little bit like our cell phones. Maybe that's a hint about our cell phones, right? Do I have enough energy? Am I fully yavan? Right? You think about it like that? If you turn it around, okay? So we got the yud. I just thought about it. Right? We got the yud, the vav, and the, and the nun of it. Really beautiful letters. Really symmetrical. But it's the only letters in the Jewish alphabet that don't have a panemius. There's no inside to them. They're just they're very straight. And olive... It's got, it's got some meat to it. It's got thickness to it. Yud vav nun very, very, very flat. Very, it looks beautiful, but it's only beautiful on the outside. There's one letter in the Hebrew alphabet that represents righteousness. A tzaddik. Which letter is that? A tzaddik. Right? The name of the letter it represents that, that element. A tzaddik is like a tzaddik. If you take the letter tzaddik and you put it in front of the word yud vav nun, what does it spell out? Seal. Seal. The Jewish people, we value beauty as well. But what do we put in front of it? The righteousness. That is the beauty of Yerushalayim. Ten measures of beauty came down to the world. Nine took Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is a beautiful city, but so is Greek. So is Rome. There's a lot of beautiful cities all around the world. But in Yerushalayim, the beauty is because we're able to connect the physical and the spiritual beauty into one. 